So you can get a beekeeping catalog and it's 150 pages and they try to convince you that you need two of everything. You don't, you don't need all of that stuff. Some of those tools you'll never even use. Some of them can be very, very useful for very specific tasks like queen rearing or honey harvesting or, and different things. But for your average day-to-day -day beekeeping tasks, this is all you need to carry around with you. You need a beehive, of course, some place for your bees to live, a bee smoker, a hive tool, and some protective clothing. There's a few other items you might like, but these are, are basically what you want. This is your smoker. You've probably seen pictures of these, you've seen them in movies. You wonder, why do beekeepers need that can? Well, people learned thousands of years ago that smoke calms bees down, and this is because bees communicate with pheromones, this language of chemical odors. Now, some people will tell you, or you read sometimes, that bees think there's a forest fire, and so they're all scared, and they fill up on honey, and they can't sting you because they're full of honey. If you oversmoke a hive, that is true that they will gorge themselves on honey, but you don't want to cause your bees to rip open all the honeycombs and gorge all on the honey and get ready to fly off. You're using way too much smoke if you're doing that. But bees have this language where they give off these different odors that convey very specific messages from one bee to another or from one bee to the entire hive or from the hive to individual bees. And the smoke interferes with that language and especially one that we call alarm pheromone you can imagine what this what kind of reaction this causes in a beehive it's given off whenever a bee feels threatened or upset so you can stand in front of a honeybee colony in front of a beehive all day and watch them coming and going and usually they will ignore you but you give it one swift kick and you can imagine what's going to happen suddenly they think that nice person that was standing there, they don't pay any more attention to you than they would a tree. Suddenly that's a threat and they're all going to come at you right to your face. So when a bee gets upset, she gives off this odor and you can actually smell it. Sometimes you might smell it in your beehive and you won't know what it is. It smells like banana peels. It's got the same chemical in it that banana peels do. It smells like bananas. It's isopentyl acetate or isoamyl acetate for you, you chemistry majors. But when a bee stings you, you are tagged in a very specific spot. I got stung on my hand the other day when I was working on my bees. So they tagged me right there. This hand is an intruder. Guess what? I got stung again. Guess where? About an inch away. So I took my smoker. I puffed a lot of smoke all over my hand. And uh, I tried to cover that, that odor up. But if you don't, you're going to get more stings probably very close to that same spot. It quickly alerts other bees to danger. So the bees in the hive, they smell that, and that's like ringing a bell. They come out, and they are ready with the pointy end. And you can imagine what they do with that. So alarmed bees release more alarm pheromone. They don't even know what happened. They're just spreading the word. I smell bananas. Quick give off some more of that odor and the next bee says uh oh red alert and it puts the whole hive on uh on on alert and it makes them very defensive and and very stingy not aggressive but defensive if you're not bothering them they're going to leave you alone but they kind of spread out into the area around a hive and they patrol that perimeter this is what makes Africanized bees a little bit more dangerous, the so-called killer bees. They're the same species of honeybees, but they are very, very defensive. They launch a lot more defensive bees when they get that signal. They spread out farther, and they will chase you a lot farther than the European honeybees. Learning how to light your smoker and using it correctly is a very important skill. You're just going to have to develop that. But basically, you want to start a fire in the bottom of the can. Use a piece of paper, something like that, and get it going pretty good. Loosely fill in with some, some kind of fuel. I like pine needles. You can't go wrong with pine needles. If you've got a single pine tree, you've got plenty of pine needles. And they grow everywhere around here. Loosely pack it in. Continue to pump this bellows. It pushes oxygen, air in at the bottom and out the top, and it, it provides fresh oxygen. Add more fuel, a little at a time, pack that thing full, cram it full as much as you can, but a little at a time, 
pumping the bellows as you go so you don't smother that fire in the bottom. So many people fill that whole can with pine needles and throw a match in the top, and that'll burn for about five minutes, then it goes out. You've got to get the fire going in the bottom, and you've got to keep it going. So every few minutes, even if you don't need it, you're not using it, reach over there and squeeze that bellows and puff some air in there. You've got to keep it, it going in the bottom, but you want it to smolder when you're not using it, just so it stays lit. And then when you need smoke, you give it a few puffs and it really gets going. If it's sitting there and nobody's touching it and it's just billowing out with smoke, that means it's not packed in there tight enough. There's too much oxygen. That or it's about to run out. So you want to want to repack it. If you're shooting flames out the top, you're doing it wrong. Your bees aren't going to like that. That means that you're either running out of fuel or you lit it at the wrong end. Uh, if you're, you're shooting out a lot of embers and stuff, get a handful of green grass, not dry grass, and put that in the top. That'll catch a lot of those sparks. But not all smokers are created equal. They all look pretty much the same. This is called a cold blast smoker. They've gone through numerous design changes over the years, but this design works really well because all the fuel in the top catches is supposed to catch all of the sparks. You can get a fancy copper one that's really expensive it doesn't work any better. It just looks better until you use it a couple of times. I love this picture. It's just a homemade one from a can. They've got these electric ones now. It's got a fan and a big battery in that. I mean, you can lug that thing around if you want, but you know, honestly, one like this is going to be great. The thing that's going to wear out first is the bellows. So I've still got my very first smoker. It's got about three layers of duct tape on it, but I'm still using it. Uh, the hinge will wear out too, but you know, you can stick a nail in there and, and keep it going. A lot of them have this wire cage on them, and that's good for a couple of reasons. One, it's got this hook. You can hook it on the, the edge of your beehive while you're working there, and it stays in a convenient place for you to reach it. Also, if uh, this one doesn't have the, the wire rack around it, you're going to dent that one, you're going to drop it, you're going to kick it, you're going to put a big dent in that really easily. And if you dent it, then the lid will never quite go back on to the top without a lot of fighting. But uh, with the, this rack, wire cage around it, it's, it's going to keep it from getting damaged. Also, uh, you're not going to bump into that red hot side of that thing with a fire in it as easily. So that's there to protect you. It's there to protect itself. And it's got that handy hook on there. So I highly recommend one of those. Invest $30, $45 in one of those, get a good one, it'll last you a long, long time. Um, they've got plastic bellows now, or they're made out of leather and wood, but they're all, they're all pretty much basically the same as far as where they function. What do you burn in your smoker? Pretty much anything you can find laying around in the yard. Uh, anything natural. Like I said, pine needles are great. Uh, you've all seen red sumac. It grows on every road in this state. Pick those little red seed heads off in the fall. They're wet and sticky and they're impossible to light, but once they dry out, they make great smoke. If you've got a bale of hay, that can work. Burlap is fantastic. Used to, every farm had lots of seed sacks made out of burlap, but now they're all made out of plastic or else they're treated with chemicals to keep rats from chewing on them. Uh, so those are a lot harder to find, but burlap is great. You just roll it up and you stick it down in your smoker. Old cotton t-shirts, not polyester, but cotton. Uh, same with blue jeans. Old blue jeans work great. Corn cobs. Uh, you can buy smoker fuels from the catalogs, but you don't really need to. Sometimes you, you get some, but, but it's a lot of paper pulp and stuff. Um, if you ever pass a cotton gin out in East Arkansas, there's just like tumbleweeds of white, dirty cotton rolling down the road. That stuff is great smoker fuel, too. Um, but uh, those are actually pellets from a, a pellet wood stove. So if you have one of those, those burn pretty well. They're a little harder to get going. You can use a blowtorch or something, but uh, once they, they do, they burn for a long time. But usually whatever you can find. And when you start running out, you just look around and you pick some dry grass. There are things like oak leaves that make a really horrible smoke. Probably irritates the bees too, but uh, you know, 
whatever you can find works pretty well. I like pine needles because I've got a lot of them. They're free and I like to put them down on the ground around my beehives because it keeps the grass from growing up under my hives and in front of it. And while I'm standing there, if I need a handful of smoker fuel, then I can just reach down and grab some and I can always come back and, and put some more down later. But avoid cardboard boxes that have a lot of printing and dyes, magazines, things like that. There's no telling what kind of chemicals are in that and, and you don't necessarily want to be burning stuff with a lot of, a lot of toxic stuff inside. You don't know what it is. So your beehive smoker is your most important tool, but you're also going to need a hive tool. And there's all different kinds of these, different shapes and sizes. Uh, it's basically just a pry bar, but it's a little bit thinner. And actually, I find that they're useful for all kinds of carpentry stuff, too. But uh, basically, you use them for, for scraping and prying because everything inside the beehive is sticky. And it's got burr comb, all kinds of bits of extra comb in different places, and that, that sticky propolis. This is a hive where this, uh, this gentleman had his inner cover turned upside down. And so there was about a half an inch of space on the top that was now on the bottom. And so bees built a half inch of comb on top of every single frame. And so now it's all a big mess. It's got honey in it. And to get down in there, he's got to scrape all that off. So it's a waste because the, the bees did all that work. And now he's just going to scrape it all off. You know, if you do that, put it all out somewhere nearby, the bees will lick it all clean, and then you've got some beeswax that you can melt onto your plastic foundation. So it, don't ever let it go to waste. Don't just throw beeswax off into the yard and forget about it, because you'll step on it and then you'll track it in on your carpet later. Same with propolis. Don't just throw it on the ground because it'll get on the bottoms of your boots. Get an extra hive tool, because they always disappear. You will find it with your lawnmower, but that's not a pleasant thing to do. Get one and paint it hot pink or hunter's orange or something because they just tend to, to disappear. And this is a bee brush. These are pretty inexpensive, a couple of bucks. Get one of these. It's a gentle way to move bees around without upsetting them usually. A puff of smoke and a little gentle brushing. Uh, when you go to harvest your honey, if you're not doing this on a large scale, just brush the bees off each comb and, and, and take it away. Or if you're moving combs around, you want to see what, what's going on underneath, then you might want to uh, use your bee brush. And when you're closing your beehives up, you can brush them off the, ex, uh, the extra bees off of the edges. Give them a little puff of smoke and brush them back in before you set the next box down on top so that you, you don't crush any buggy who's walking around up there. This is a frame gripper. For a couple of years, everybody had to have a frame grip, but I think everybody's realized that these aren't necessarily something you really need. I've got one and I use it so much, I don't even know where it is. But the only time I ever really use these is if I'm teaching. If I wanna be able to show people, you can, you can grab hold of that frame and lift it up and then you can point with your other hand. Otherwise, you're holding each corner of the frame. But if you wanna show people what's going on, those are handy. But you've got to maintain a death grip on that thing. Because if you get distracted and you loosen your grip a little bit, there's something called gravity that's gonna teach you a lesson. The bees don't mind that ride all the way to the ground, but they do not like the landing. And that's when that alarm pheromone comes out. So uh, make sure that you, you do hold on to them tight. And this is a, a frame perch, there's different names for it, but it kind of sits on the, the edge of your hive when you have it open. As you take a couple of frames out and you're looking around inside, it just gives you a place to set them so you don't have to, to set them down on the ground. And the nice thing about bees, most bees, good bees, is as long as you keep that frame in a, a vertical orientation, even if you turn it sideways, but as long as you keep it upright, those bees are going to hang out on that comb and keep doing what they were doing. So you can just put a couple of frames there as you're working along. And there's even hive stands now that have these built in. And they put them right at shin height. So if you're not paying attention, you can stab yourself right in the, right in the tibia. So those can be useful. But again, it's just one more thing that you have to lug around from hive to hive if you've got quite a few beehives. You will want some protective clothing. At the very minimum, you're going to want one of these, a veil. A lot of times they, they come with a hat or it's, it's built into the hat. Some of them are flat, they fold up. Uh, some of them are all, all one piece. Uh, lots of different styles, but this just keeps the bees off of your face, out of your ears. 
you know, you're used to seeing bees when you're wearing one of these, you see bees walking around on the outside and you're looking at the bees underside. You see the bees belly and then you're going to see a bee out of the corner of your eye at one point and you're going to realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm looking at that bee's back. That means she's on the inside. I have seen people panic. I saw a guy yank his veil off <laughs> And there was about a quarter of a second, and there was that look in his eye when he realized what he just did. There was one bee on the inside, but there was 40,000 bees on the outside. And he was still standing right over the hive when he did that. So if a bee gets inside, that's the offsides rule. You just you reach up through this uh, loose part right here, and you just give her a little pinch, and you dispatch that one, and she'll drop down, and you can shake it out. People think the bees are looking for a way to get inside. No, they're not. You've just got dozens of bees walking around on you, and one of them just happened to find that little spot. So some of these, uh, they, they tie on, and there's kind of this little trick knot that you, you do, and it keeps it nice and tight on your shoulders. But as you're moving around and, and you're doing a lot of work, those do get loosened up. So you got to check them periodically. For a very casual inspection, it's not a big deal. But if you're going to be doing a lot of work, you might want to invest in a uh, a more substantial bit of protective clothing. Uh, so you can get some that come down under your arms with different straps and, and nets and things, or you can get the full jacket like this. It zips on, goes all the way down your arms. Uh, this has got a dome hood. Some of them uh, unzip in the front so you can step away and you can chug some water and zip it back up, or you can answer your phone, different things. Um, you can wear your own favorite hat underneath that. Um, the only thing I don't like about these is sometimes uh, if, if you're wearing one that's a little bit big for you, it tends to flop around and you stand up and it flops back and it's right up against your face and you've got like 15 bees there and all of a sudden they're in your nose. They can't quite get in your nose, but their stingers can go through there. So it's enough to make you nervous. That's why a lot of times you see people wearing a hat with those. Uh, you, if you want more protection, you can go for the full coveralls. They have them in every size now. Used to you couldn't find kids sizes very easily, but now they're, they're widely available. You can get different size hats that go with them, but they've got Velcro and zippers and flaps and, and uh, all kinds of stuff. They've got elastic at the cuffs and they'll go tight around your ankles. These are hot and heavy in the summertime. The more gear you're putting on, you're out there in July and August in Arkansas, these things get hot. One reason they're white is so that they're not quite as hot. You don't want to wear a black suit in, in the summertime. But also, bees are less defensive towards light colors. That's another reason that, that a lot of these are white. If you ever see a beekeeper wearing a perfectly pure white suit, don't ask him any questions. They don't have any idea what they're doing. If you want advice, talk to the filthiest beekeeper you can find. They've got some street cred. They know what they're talking about. Now, these are, are fairly new. They're called uh, ultra breeze suits or these mesh suits, but there's three layers. There's a thin mesh and then there's a, a layer of, it's kind of a foam mesh in the center and then another thin mesh on the other side, but they're kind of sandwiched together and the bee stinger is not long enough to go all the way through. And so these are, allow a breeze to go through and as long as the wind is blowing, they're really comfortable. But when there's no breeze, they're about five pounds heavier than any other bee suit. So some people like these, some, some people don't, but they're definitely more expensive. Used to be they were all white. Now you can get them in any color. You can even get a camo one so you can go out, bring your deer rifle when you're out there at the beehive. You can look like a bunch of flowers. This one looks like a hazmat suit to me. I don't know, but there's all different colors, shapes, and sizes, so you can make a real fashion statement now while you're out checking on your bees. A lot of people like gloves. Some people wear them, some people don't. Um, they are sting resistant, but they are not sting proof. Bees can sting right through those gloves, unless you get some really thick cowhide. And when you get the really thick gloves, it makes it difficult to even feel what it is that you're doing. So the, the thinner gloves actually work better. And a lot of beekeepers don't wear gloves at all, more experienced ones. They get stung more, but uh, it's really kind of easier to, to be able to feel what it is that you're doing. I do recommend that you have some gloves. Uh, whether you, you're going to be wearing them or not, you probably want to keep them around. A lot of bee suits have these little loops down on the end of the sleeves, and that's to put around your thumb. 
And then when you slide your glove on, it doesn't push your sleeve all the way up. It keeps it right there. And after a few years, they get stretched out, and I wind up putting them around four fingers instead of the thumb, but it works the same way. Uh, a lot of people are using plastic gloves now, disposable gloves, exam gloves. Uh, and the reason is not that they're sting-proof, but it's uh, because of propolis. That propolis gets on everything. You'll spend 45 minutes trying to get it out from under your fingernails and out of your fingerprints and everything else. So uh, it's easy to just peel these off. And you can still feel everything that the bees are, are, are doing. You can feel the frames and everything. But if you snag yourself on a nail or something, of course, they do rip right open. So you get all your protective clothing. You got the full coveralls coming on. You got the hat, the gear, big boots. You've put on everything you can get because you love nature, right? That's why you want to become a beekeeper. You love nature. You want to get in touch with nature. You just don't want any nature in here with you. You've become an astronaut beekeeper. You are completely sealed up from your environment so that you can enjoy all that nature. If you're an urban beekeeper, think about the message that you're sending to your neighbors that may be a little bit nervous about your new hobby. Relax, you tell them. I'm getting some honeybees, but you're going to be fine on the other side of that chain link fence. I'm not going out there without a suit of armor on, but you're going to be fine over there. Just keep mowing your lawn. Your kids are playing in their sandbox. They won't bother you. No, don't worry about that. So just be aware of that, that subconscious message that, that you're sending. As I said, a lot of experienced beekeepers tend to start shedding some of that excessive uh, gear. You may not ever get quite this comfortable with your bees, <laughs> but you know, uh, at some point you're going to misplace a glove or you're going to think, well, I just need to do a quick check. I need to feed them. I need to do something. So I'm just going to get in there and you're going to realize, hey, that wasn't so bad. I didn't get stung to death. And that was actually a little bit easier. So uh, you might start going without gloves and then you're going to get down to a more uh, minimal bee suit. My favorite is to have the, uh, the jacket. And the reason is propolis. Uh, I like it because it covers my, my, my shirt because I have ruined so many shirts. When you pick up a beehive and you got to carry it from here to there, it rests up against you. And so you wind up with this line of propolis across your middle. So I've ruined enough shirts that, that I like to have that jacket. It goes on easy, it comes off easy, and it doesn't let any bees in around the neck. But uh, there are places they can still get in if, if you're not careful. Oftentimes, actually, uh, what I find is I, I get all geared up, I'm getting ready, I'm lighting my smoker, I go over there, I open up my beehive, and I look down and I realize that while I put the hood on and I zipped it up around the neck, I did not zip the jacket up, and so it's just hanging wide open, and, and I've already got bees inside, so do pay attention. But as you get more comfortable with your bees, you're going to gain experience, your bees are going to be more comfortable with you because you're treating them a little bit easier. You're, you're more, more gentle with them. You're not wearing these big thick gloves and so you're not smashing bees. Every time you smash a bee, it gives off alarm pheromones. So uh, it, you're just going to learn how to work with them a little bit easier. Most of the suppliers have a beginner's kit that, that says it's got everything you need to keep bees to get started. But uh, read the fine print, look at what you're getting. It may look like a good deal, but if you're only looking at the price when it comes, you realize that's a styrofoam box and it's the cheapest smoker made out of tin foil. And if you had just invested a little bit more, you could have gotten a, a much bigger hive that's gonna grow with you. You could have gotten a better bee suit with it. Um, sometimes you get a book, sometimes you get a bag of smoker fuel, things like that. So. Uh, if you're not sure what it is you're looking at, not sure what you're looking for, then you know, uh, ask another beekeeper.